Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our celebration of Sri Krishna's birthday. We will commence with group chanting of Chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita, plus the English meaning. That will be led by the nuns, so please join in. I'll be sharing that, putting it up on the screen. And welcome to those who have joined us already by Zoom. After the chanting, we'll have talks by Rupa Taka, followed by a talk by Prabhu Jeeva Daj Pramaji. So now I'll request the nuns to lead us in the chanting. Just give me a moment to put it up on screen. पार्थाय प्रतिबोधिता भगवता नारायणे न स्वयं व्यासे न ग्रथिता पुराण मुनिना मध्ये महाभारतम अद्वैतामृतवर्षिणी भगवती अष्टादशाध्यायिनी अंबत्वाम अनुसंदधामि Bhagavad-gite Bhavad-dveshini Chapter 12 Bhakti Yoga The Yoga of Devotion Arjuna Uvaja Evam satata yuktaye Bhaktastvam paryupasate Echapyaksharam avyaktam Tesham ke yoga vittamaha Arjuna said Those devotees who ever steadfast, worship you thus, and those again who worship the imperishable, the unmanifest. Which of these are better words in yoga? Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Maya Vesya Mano Yemam Nitya Yukta Upasate Shraddhaya Parayo Petas Teme Yukta Tama Mataha The Blessed Lord said, those who have fixed their minds on me and who ever steadfast and endowed with supreme shraddha worship me, they do, I consider, perfect in yoga. Etvaksharama nirdesyam avyaktam paryupasate sarvatragama chindyam cha but those who worship the imperishable, the indefinable, the unmanifest, the omnipresent, the unbreakable, the unchangeable, the immovable, the eternal. Samniyam mendriya gramam sarvatra samabuddhayaha te prapnuvandi mameva Sarva bhuta hite rataha. Having restrained all the senses, even minded everywhere, engaged in the welfare of all beings, verily they also come unto me. Klesho dhikataras tesham avyakta sakta chetasam avyakta hi gater dukham. Greater is their difficulty whose minds are set on the unmanifested. For the good of the unmanifested is very hard for the embodied to reach. Yetu sarvani karmani mai sanyasya matpara ananyenaiva yogena upasate. But those who worship me, renouncing all actions in me, regarding me as a supreme goal, meditating, meditating on me with single-minded yoga, Teshama hamsa mudharta mrityu samsara sagarat bhavami nachirat partha for them whose thought is set on me, 
I become very soon, O Partha, the deliverer from the ocean of the mortal samsara. Mai eva mana adhatswa, mai buddhim niveshaya, nivasishyasi mai eva, ata urdhvam na samshaya. Fix your mind on me alone. Let your thoughts dwell in me. You will hereafter live in me alone. Of this there is no doubt. Athachittam samadhatum nashakno shi mayisthiram abhyasa yogena tato mamichaptum dhananjaya If you are not able to fix your mind steadily on me, O Dhananjaya, then seek to reach me by Abhyasa Yoga. Abhyase Pyasamarthosi Matkarma Paramo Bhava Madarthama Pikarmani Kurvan Siddhim Avapsyasi. If you are unable even to practice Abhyasa Yoga, be you intent on doing actions for my sake. Even by performing actions for my sake, you will attain perfection. Adhaida dapya shaktosi kartum mad yoga mashritaha sarva karma bhalatyagam tatakuru yatatmavan. If you are not able to do even this, then taking refuge in me, abandon the fruits of all action with the self. Subdued. Shreyo hi jnana mabhyasat jnana dhyanam vishishyate jnana karma bharatyagas tyaga chandera nandaram. Better indeed is knowledge than formal abhyasa. Better than knowledge is meditation. Better than meditation is the renunciation of the fruits of action. Peace immediately follows renunciation. Shta sarva bhutanam maitra karuna evacha nirmamo nirahankara samadukha sukhakshami sandushta satatam yogi yatatma dridhanishchayaha mayarpita mano buddhir Yo madbhakta same priyaha. He who hates no being, who is friendly and compassionate to all, who is free from the feeling of I and mine, even minded in pain and pleasure and forbearing, ever content, steady in meditation, self controlled, and possessed of firm conviction, with mind and intellect fixed on me. He, my devotee, is dear to me. Anapeksha Shuchir. No. 50. Esmano dvichate loko, lokano dvichate chayaha, harsha masha bhayo dve gair mukto ya sachame priyaha. He by whom the world is not afflicted and whom the world cannot afflict. He who is free from joy, anger, fear, and anxiety, he is dear to me. Anapeksha shuchir daksha udasi no gatavyataha sarvaram bhaparityagi yo madbhakta same priyaha He who has no wants, who is pure and prompt, unconcerned, untroubled, and who is selfless in all his undertakings, he who is thus devoted to me is dear to me. Yo nahrishyati na dveshti na shochati na kamkshati shubha shubha parityagi bhaktiman yasame priyaha He who neither rejoices nor hates nor grieves, nor desires, renouncing good and evil, full of devotion, he is dear to me. 
सम शत्रौ च मित्रे च तथा मनापमो शीतोष्ण सुख दुखेशु सम संग विवर्जि तुल्य निंदास्तुतेर्मौनी संदुष्टो येन केनचि अनिकेतस्तिरमतिर्भक्तिमान मे प्रि नर He who is same to foe and friend, and also in honor and dishonor, who is the same in cold and heat, in pleasure and pain, who is free from attachment, to whom censure and praise are equal, who is silent, content with anything, homeless, steady-minded, full of devotion, that man is dear to me. ये दुधर्म्यामृतमिद यथोक्त पर्युपासते श्रद्धानामत्परमा भक्तास्ते दीव मे प्रिया दे वेरली हु फॉलो दिस इमोटल धर्म डिस्क्राइब अबव इन ड्यूड विथ श्रद्धा लुकिंग अपॉन मी एस अ सुप्रीम गोल एंड डिवोटेड दे आर एक्सीडिंगली डियर टू मी ओम्सत्मद्भगवद्गीतासु उपनिषत्सु ब्रह्म विद्यागशास्त्रे श्रीकृष्णाजुन संवाद भक्ति नाम द्वादशोध्याय हरिओ तत्स Pranam Mataji's and respected devotees, I would like to start today with great gratitude in my heart for dear Gayatri Pranaji, our loving Mataji, for thinking of me to do this talk on the auspicious occasion of Janmashtami. My dear friend Ami introduced me to Ram Krishna Mission and Sharda Math about six to seven years ago. I had always heard about them, but never got to know them in so much depth. I am forever grateful to both of you. For now, I know about these organizations. When Mataji asked me to talk about something on Krishna, I said to myself, "What is that first thought that comes to my mind when I think about Krishna?" And the answer was instant: Seva. In other words, my service to Krishna. And why Seva? Being born and raised in a family of Pushti Marga Vaishnavas, Krishna Seva was embedded in all of us. My grandmother, also a Vaishnav, was a Brahm Sambandhi and made sure that all her children, their partners, and grandchildren were also initiated into Pushti Mark. For those of you who do not know what Pushti Mark and Brahm Sambandhi is, let me tell you a bit about it. The word Pushti means grace, and Mark means path. So Pushti Mark is the path to reach Krishna. There are many schools of thoughts or paths to obtain the grace of Krishna and reach him. As we are Pushti Vaishnavas, we follow the path of Pushti Mark. In short, Pushti Mark is spontaneous, selfless, and motiveless love for Sri Krishna. This path of spiritual grace was introduced to us by Sri Vallabhacharya Ji, popularly known to some as Mahaprabhu Ji. He, after a deep study, contemplation, and personal experience, simplified the path to experience the Lord and gave us easy principles to follow. For example, we go to different schools. The subjects to be studied are the same, but each school follows its own protocol. 
starting from the uniform to the types of teachers and methods of teaching. We, being followers of Pushti school of thought, practice the set of rules laid by a guru, Sri Vallar. Pushti Mark also leads to spiritual nourishments. It is a path of devotion through God's grace. To follow this path, one has to be initiated by Guru, who is from the lineage of Sri Mahaprabhuji, and this initiation is called Brahm Sambandh. The importance of Brahm Sambandh lies in the fact that in the ceremony, you offer all that belongs to you to the feet of Krishna, lovingly known as Thakurji in Pushti Mark. You offer your body, your soul, your wealth, and everything else that belongs to you, which would cause you to be attached to objects. One must note that Pushtimarg is based on pure love for Sri Krishna and only aims at realizing his true love. Its aim is Krishna's happiness. It does not know any boundaries, be it time, place, or anything else. It does not require a devotee to give up a host, householder's life. In fact, Vallabhacharya Ji showed us how one can serve him better by being a householder. This is different from other philosophies that we have been hearing about Pushtimar. Some say it requires a life of contemplation as a monk. In this path laid out by Mahaprabhuji, all the worldly desires are diverted towards Sri Krishna, so they are not required to be suppressed. In fact, all days of the year are nicely described by Sri Vallab that almost every day of the Hindu calendar is an utsa a celebration. Sri Vallabh says in Pushti Mark, the world should not look down upon, but should be treated as Sri Krishna's creation and thus as real Krishna himself. In Krishna's philosophy, seva is an expression of love and devotion, much like the Bhakti Yoga. The Bhagavad Gita underscores that acts performed with devotion and selflessness are deeply valued by the divine. Krishna's life itself is a testament to this principle as he engages in acts of service, protection, and guidance for his devotees. His interactions with his gopis, his protection of his devotees, his role as a guide to Arjun, all illustrate the importance of selfless service and his leela. According to traditional Indian philosophy, there are three main paths to the divine or three yogas as described by Lord Krishna in the Gita. The path of knowledge or Gyan Yoga, the path of action or Karma Yoga, and the path of devotion or Bhakti Yoga. For the purpose of the talk today, I want to discuss the latter two, Karma and Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is just what we talked about. But what about Karma Yoga? Let's ask this question to ourselves. Are we better off sitting still and meditating upon the divine, chanting his name and attempting to experience our inherent oneness with him? Or are we better getting up and selflessly serving his creation? This question arises quite frequently on the spiritual path. What and which is more important? Will I attain enlightenment, liberation, moksha, or the state of divine bliss faster in lotus posture with eyes closed, offering seva, or with eyes open, hands working? Is there really any true difference between the two? Are there really two distinct paths? There is a wonderful story of a devoted man who spent a great deal of time each day in meditation and prayer. One day in his meditation, he heard God's voice commanding him. There is a large boulder in the field just opposite your house. I want you to push that boulder with all your might. So the man immediately rose and went to the field. He pushed and perspired, but the boulder didn't budge. Finally exhausted under a sky long since dark, he returned home. The following morning before sunrise, eager to complete the Lord's bidding, he was out in the field again, pushing and perspiring. Still, the boulder hadn't moved an inch. This went on for days, weeks, and months, but the boulder was firm as it was ever. Finally, one day, the man collapsed in despair. He called out loudly, his voice choking with tears. My Lord, I have failed you. You gave me such a simple task, and even that I wasn't unable to fulfill. I'm useless and worthless of your favor. Please forgive me. The Lord responded lovingly. My child, 
I never asked you to move the molder. I put it there, and therefore I understand it cannot be moved by human might. All I asked was that you push against it. In pushing against it for the last several weeks, look at how your arms and legs have strengthened. Do you see the firm muscles where loose flesh had hung before? Look at how healthy your sallow skin tone has become. There is a shine on your skin now, strength in your step, firmness and flexibility in your body. This task was not about moving the rock. It was about molding you. If I wanted the rock moved, I would have moved it myself. What I wanted for you, for you was to experience physical labor, for you to feel the sunshine upon your skin, for you to know the fatigue of a hard day's work, and for you to see how much more potential your body has than what you had imagined. Many times we mistake the meaning of seva. We think it is about the end, about the goal, about success. We see it as a task before us that we undertake with a feeling of generosity or devotion. However, seva is much more than that. It teaches us to do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Seva teaches and trains us to see the divine in all. It is not just about us serving elaborate bogs through delicacies and feasts and offer prolonged hours sitting in front of the Lord. It is not about we who are privileged giving to them who are disadvantaged. It is a practice of seeing them as us. Every religion in the world teaches us that we are all one. Hinduism says, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family. Christianity says, love thy neighbor as thyself. In order to truly, deeply, and fully love another being as myself, I must see that person as myself. Otherwise, we can never love one another as much or in the same way as we love ourselves. That oneness connects us with the divine, and the goal is to see the divine in all whom we are serving, whether a child, a woman, a patient, an animal, or river. When we see the divine in those whom we are serving, then of course we will work with sincerity, focus, attention, dedication, and commitment. After all, we are serving God. We are serving the true self. The other important aspect of seva is how it shapes us. Like the man in the story, Seva is what tunes us and tones us, not just the body, the mind, the thoughts, the ego. It is one thing to sit in, sit in meditation and feel egoless. It is another to serve in the world with no ego. It is one thing to find a state of peace and stillness of the mind sitting silently in a forest or temple. It is quite another to find the same state of peace and stillness amid a major Seva project. That is the goal. The joy, the peace, oneness, and divine connection we feel in meditation and prayer is what we carry with us into the day of Seva. Just as we can see the divine in the images in our temple, can we see the same divine in everyone with whom we interact, in everyone and everything for whom and with whom we are serving. To sum it all, Krishna says Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga go hand in hand. And in the higher level of awareness, they merge into one. After all, is loving someone any different from bringing him a cup of tea? Is loving someone any different from wiping his or her feverish forehead? Of course not. There is no way to determine where love ends, service begins. When the love is true and pure, service is the most natural outcome. Conversely, through seva, we attain a state of love and unity, which deepens and enriches our love and devotion. Slowly, slowly, we realize there are simply two sides of the same coin, two streams flowing and merging together into the great ocean and ultimately into the Supreme Lord's refuge. Thank you, Jai Krishna.
Thank you, Rupa. It is wonderful. I'm so happy that I asked you. <laughs> you can wait, we'll give, more chance will be coming for you. <laughs> now we know that you, you are a good speaker. We'll make use of you. Jaitu Jaitu Devo Devaki Nandani Nandanoyam Jaitu Jaitu Krishna Krishna Vamsa Pradipaha Jaitu Jaitu Mekha Shyamala Komalangu Jaitu Jaitu Pradhvi Bhara Nasho Mukundaha Victory to the Supreme Divinity Born as the delightsome child of Devaki Victory to Sri Krishna who brought light to the Vishni race Victory to that embodiment of tender beauty with a cloud blue complexion. Victory to Mukunda who removes the burden of the earth caused by the wicked. <clears throat> Sri Krishna's life has two parts. The early years that he spent in Vrindavan as the darling of the cowherds men, women, and children, enchanting all by his pranks, and at the same time, destroying the evildoers. <clears throat> Some of the, his most important supernatural powers were shown at this time when he lived in Vrindavan. The second part is starts from the time he leaves Vrindavan, goes to Madhura. The first act is the, the destruction of the tyrant king Kamsa. Then he emerges as the leader of the Vrishni clan. He established a new kingdom on the western side of India with, with um, Dwaraka as its capital. He established the kingdom, but he never assumed kingship. He was Never a king. Krishna was never a king. He was a king maker. He was making and uh, pulling down kings. He himself never assumed the kingship. <clears throat> and we can say Krishna played a very important um, role in shaping the political and cultural life of India of that time. Along with a, being a great diplomat, Sri Krishna was also a great philosopher and a spiritual teacher. The greatest contribution in the spiritual field is the gospel of Bhagavata Dharma that he propagated. And it is chiefly expounded in the Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> when you look at the teachings, Bhagavata Dharma caters for everybody. The Vedic uh, teachings were only for the elite. Only the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, the two upper castes were um, allowed or they, they, were, they were only eligible for learning the Vedic Vedas. And the Upanishads, they are too tough. They had to be highly intelligent to understand them. But there was nothing for the rest of the humanity. And Sri Krishna brought this Bhagavata Dharma. He opened the doors of spirituality for one and all, irrespective of caste, creed, gender, race, nothing. No, no bar. It's open for everybody. This gospel of Bhagavata Dharma that we see both in the Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, we can see that it's open for all. It's gospel of devotion, at the same time, including the work aspect, as of, um, as Rupa said, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, everything is combined together. <clears throat> the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, because my my topic is Shri Krishna and the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, so I'm uh, uh, stressing on that. The teachings of Bhagavad Gita was given in the battlefield, not in a hermitage or a monastery in the din and bustle of the battlefield. <clears throat> and he, Krishna is harmonizing all the four yogas. Karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, and raja yoga. Everything, all the four paths 
are harmonized in the Bhagavad Gita, but we can see a little more stress, emphasis given on the path of action. Because there's a need. Because he's talking to Arjuna in the battlefield, in the, in the midst of action, not in a monastery where people are sitting for meditation, no. Or in a temple where doing, they're doing prayers and pujas, no. It's the battlefield, a midst of action. So Krishna is emphasizing on path of action. And how to act? It's a path of selfless action. And it, this path of selfless action is a unique contribution of Sri Krishna to the Indian spiritual thought. Now, how are we to perform action? We all have to do work. work. Nobody can avoid work. As Krishna says in the, in the Gita, third chapter, nobody can remain even for a moment without doing performing action. We think that we are not doing anything. You all think you are sitting quietly. You are not doing anything. Yes, you are doing a lot of work. You are listening. And the body is continuously working. You are thinking. You are breathing. You are, uh, your digestive system is working. All the whole internal organs are working. So action is being performed. The only person who does not do any work is a dead person. Now, everybody else has to work. Nobody can avoid work, even for a moment. So how are we to perform action then? Shri Krishna says, Nirashi nirmama bhutva yudhasya vigatajjali. Be free from <coughs> desires and egotism. Nirashi nirmama. Free from desire and egotism. Fight on without any mental fever. We all got mental fever. Especially those who are going to work in office, business, whatever it is, a lot of stress. Everybody's got stressed out. So they get agitated, stressed. The mind is so much disturbed. Krishna says, fight on, work on without any mental fever. How are to do that? When we are free from, free from desires and free from egotism. When then there won't be any tension in the work. It's a message for the present age. If you look at the world, it seems we have got more stress and strain, tension now than maybe a, now, two generations ago. Our grandparents, I don't think they've had so much of a stress and strain and tension. And earlier, they have more... Uh, Calm, calmer mind, but now the stress is increasing. <clears throat> if we can keep out this egotism, I and mine, everything is mine, this identification with our um, psychophysical organism, then we will be able to discharge our duties to the family, to society, to the country, to the whole world without getting stressed, without, we can perform our duty efficiently. Then we'll be, as Krishna says, we'll be free from mental fever. That means there's intense activity of performing everything. Act, all the works we are doing, all actions, duties you are doing efficiently without any stress. Intense activity within and Sorry, intense activity externally and complete calmness inward. So in another verse in the Gita, we see Krishna saying, he who finds in the midst of intense activity, the greatest rest. See, in the midst of intense activity, the greatest rest. And in the midst of greatest rest, intense activity. I'll read that again. In he who finds in the midst of intense activity the greatest rest. Intense activity, you are acting, acting very bu busy, but you are finding great rest. And in the midst of greatest rest, intense activity. Externally, you are sitting quietly in the midst of greatest rest. No, lying down, sitting quietly. Intense activity, the mind is acting. 
he has become a yogi. <clears throat> so, extend, it is not the just the act work that tires us. It is the, the mind. It's the mind. If the mind is disturbed, even a little bit of work, you become tired. The mind is calm. You may be able to do a lot of work. But still, you can go on. Um, Swami Vivekananda explaining this to one of his disciples, he says, uh, look at the picture of Sri Krishna in the chariot as, as, the, as the charioteer of Arjuna, Partha Sarathi. Now, if you, all of you must have seen the picture, Arjuna's chariot with yoke to four horses. They are strong, powerful. The horses are trained for battlefield. So once they come to the battlefield, they are just straining themselves to charge forward. And Krishna is holding them, the reins in his hand. The four, um, you can see the, the two legs of the four horses are just clawing in the air up because they are standing on their hind legs and ready to go jump forward that horse that four horses he's straining holding them it is the reins are held in the left hand in the right hand he has got the, the stick to the whip and then Arjuna is sitting at the back he is standing back holding with his left hand the reins Turning back to Arjuna with a smile on his face, he is giving the teaching. Now, what is this? What can you say? Extreme activity in the physical uh, body, externally, in the midst of intense activity. But look at the mind. Look at the face. The, the face shows the state of mind. If you are stressed, it shows on the face. However, whatever you say, I am. Oh, no, I am not stressed. I am not worried at all. But your face shows that you are stressed. But look at our, what is, how is our, uh, Sri Krishna's face shows. Extremely calm. It's a smiling. In the beginning, he says, Prahasaniva Bharata. As though smiling, he is talking to Arjuna. <clears throat> There's no strain at all. And then Swamiji asked, now what does this picture show? Indense activity externally, indense rest within. That is the state of yoga. <clears throat> and that needs extreme detachment, non-attachment. Without that level of non-attachment, we won't be able to have that calmness. But it is very hard for us to attain. See, he said earlier, nirashi nirmama bhutva. Without Desires without the e ego, we have to work. Then we will have this state. We will be extremely active externally, extremely resting internally. But we need that extent, uh, extreme non-attachment. But for us, it's not easy. It's very difficult. So Krishna says, all right, I'll give you a lower ideal for the present time. And that is <clears throat> perform actions, but do not take the results for ourselves. You do all the work, but don't think that the results belong to you. You are doing for the God's sake. For, so offer all the results to God. Not for, you are working not for ourselves, but for the glory of God to Work, God's work. It is there. It's God's work. So I'm doing. As Rupa said, you are praying, closing your eyes, and then serving with open eyes. You are doing your duty. Because it's your duty. It is something to be done. So I do it. Not for, not for the name and fame. Not for acquiring name. No. It is to be done, so I do it because that's the right thing to do. <clears throat> and making Arjuna the immediate cause, Sri Krishna is giving the teachings to the, of Gita to the whole humanity. 
and these teachings are relevant now as it was relevant at the time when it was pronounced. How many? 7,000 years ago. <clears throat> in the Kurukshetra. And why did Krishna give the teachings of uh, the Gita in the, in the first place? Because Arjuna got in the dilemma. He didn't want to fight. After preparing for the that battle all these years, when they were banished to the forest or for 12 years and then spending one year in hiding without being recognized. All these 13 years, the one aim was get back the kingdom from Duryodhana, even if there is battle. And they were preparing for that. Arjuna went to get all sorts of weapons from gods. He did all that. So fully prepared and he knew that he will have to fail fight against Bhishma, Drona and all others. But the last moment what happened? Right in the middle of the, of the both armies arrayed together and Arjuna says, I'm not going to fight. I don't want to kill all these people. So Arjuna got in a big dilemma. He was overcome with attachment. So it is to solve this <clears throat> As as a um, except, um, what's an answer to or solve Arjuna's dilemma, Sri Krishna gave the teaching, but it is the answer to all problems of our life. It is not just for Arjuna. We all find these different problems in life. We face with different problems, and Gita gives Sri Krishna's an answer is there for us. So Mahatma Gandhi says, whenever I'm faced with any problem, I turn to Gita. Gita gives the answer. We often, what do we, 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 of, we do? We read a chapter, a few words from the Gita, salute the book, put it away, finish. It is a manual for our daily living. We don't do that. And so we suffer. <clears throat> People say that, oh, it is, we will study the Gita, it's good. But the teachings are not practicable. Can we practice all those things? It's too difficult. It's not impossible. It's impossible to do all the what Sri Krishna says. But he showed in his life that he, you know, he, he practiced all those teachings that he has given. He practiced what he preached. <clears throat> and to understand the Gita, you study the life of Sri Krishna. Best way. And so Swami Vivekananda says. Shri Krishna can never be understood until he has studied the Gita. For he was the embodiment of his own teachings. Every one of these incarnations came as a living illustration of what they came to preach. See, every one of these incarnations came as a living illustration of what they came to preach. If you look at the life of Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna, we say one of the main things, harmony of religion. And what did you do? He practiced all the different religions and found that they all lead the same goal, to God, whatever path you take. And then he said, as many faith, so many paths. They are all different paths to the same goal, God. So, and another one is renunciation, non-attachment. In his life, you can see. So every one of these, Swamiji's is, Swami is words, every one of these incarnations came as a living illustration of what they came to preach. Krishna, the preacher of Gita, was all his life the embodiment of that song celestial. He was the greatest illustration of non-attachment. He was the greatest illustration of non-attachment. He was even minded. Whatever happened, praise, blame, happiness, misery, he was not disturbed. He was even minded. So, about and, uh, uh, one of the definitions of yoga Sri Krishna gives is Samatvam Yoga Uchyate. Yoga is even mindedness. 
Did he practice even mindedness? Let us look. After the Mahabharata war, the whole Dirka Kauravas were destroyed and also Pandavas, except the five Pandavas and Sri Krishna and uh, one more person. So seven of them on the Pandava side and four on the Kaurava side. That's it. Among the 18 Akshauhanis, which is millions of people, everyone was destroyed. Say, it's not just one Holocaust, so many Holocausts. So many were destroyed. It's a complete destruction. And <clears throat> after all that, the Pandava, the five Pandava brothers went to pay their respects to Gandhari, mother of the Kauravas. She was extremely sad. She knew Duryodhana was wrong. Every time Duryodhana came before going to the battlefield, asking for her blessing, she never said, may you be victorious. Because she knew he's on the wrong side. She always said, where there is virtue, there is victory. She never blessed him, saying that you be victorious. She is a highly spiritual person. If she had blessed him, he would have won. But she, she knew he is on the wrong side. He never She never blessed him. But being the mother, lost all hundred children, it's not a, a small thing. But when the Pandavas saluted her, she controlled her sorrow, grief, and anger also, and blessed them. Then Krishna came. And she turned all her anger, grief to Krishna. And her complaint was, Krishna, if you had wanted, you could have stopped this massacre. You allowed it to happen. Krishna said, it's not my fault. It's your son. You knew your son was doing the wrong thing. You could have stopped him. Even when so many of the elders told, he never listened. What can I do? It's not my fault. It's your sons. But no, if you had decided, you could have stopped it. Now, I'm going to curse you. At the end of 36 years, you will undergo the same calamity. The whole of your clan will kill each other. Just as the Kaurava Pandavas, they both belong to the same family. They killed each other the same way your family, the clan will kill each other. Krishna was happy. He, he, his, his smile didn't go. He was still there. His smile didn't fade. He was happy in two ways, for two reasons. One thing, his um, Gandhari's grief and anger has given expression through this curse. So now she is peaceful. She won't have any more anger towards the Pandavas, five brothers. Another thing, the Vrishni clan has become so arrogant. They are born in the family of Krishna. Nobody can kill them. But they are so, because they have become so powerful and arrogant, nobody can kill them. So they have to kill each other. They become a menace to the world. They have to kill, destroy each other. So this curse is a boon for them, to, for the destruction. But because it's, it's his clan, he's not attached. He's completely unattached. That's why. And in that curse, he's still that even-minded, my smile didn't go. Samatvam yoga uchyate. <clears throat> Another definition for yoga Shri Krishna gives in the same chapter, yoga karmasu kaushalam. Yoga is efficiency in action. What do you mean by efficiency in action? Perform the least amount of work, bring out the maximum amount of research. Efficiency in action. You can see, see that. When Krishna killed destroyed Kamsa. Kamsa's son, sorry, Kamsa's wives were 
the daughters of a king, the king of Magadha by name Jarasandha. So Jarasandha wanted to take revenge for his son-in-law's death. So he attacked, came and attacked Madhura where Krishna was. Krishna and his brother Balarama with their army defeated um, Jarasandha but didn't kill him, sent him back. He again came with another collect after a few after a year or two, he came back again, collecting another army. This happened 17 times. 17 times Jarasandha came, attacked, he was defeated. They had chance to kill him, but they didn't kill him. Krishna said, no, no, let him go. Because the, the cup of evil deeds had to become full. Only then he'll be killed. And they are not the one, Krishna is not the one to, be, to kill him. So let him go, let him go. He was sent. 18th time again, he, he collected his army. And his army is 23 Akshahuni. It's a huge number. In the Mahabharata war, it was only 18 Akshahunis. And Jarasandha is collecting an army of 23 Akshahunis. Now, 18th time, Jarasandha is coming. At the same time, another king, powerful king, Kala Yavana. Yavana is actually usually the name, you, the term used for Greek people. So he's a foreigner. And he was a very powerful king. And he found that there is nobody to a powerful opponent. Whom to face? There's nobody. Then Narada said, hey, look, there are two uh, princes, Krishna and Balarama. They have defeated this powerful king Jarasandha 17 times. So they may be a fit opponent for you. Why don't you go and fight with them? So Kaleyavana came and his army consists here a troop of 350 million soldiers. Not one or two. He came with that. Now Krishna was in a dilemma. Both two armies going to fight at, uh, attacking at the same time. Kaleyavana from one side, Jarasandha from the other side. If they go to fight Yavana, Jarasandha will be attacking and killing the destroying the whole of Madhura. So what to do? He immediately ma made the decision. The whole city migrate. Got a city mill built in the west coast in Dwaraka. This is Dwaraka as the capital. Far away and <clears throat> with the help of the divine architect Vishwagarma, they built the city. Everybody was shifted there. So the whole city is safe. His people are safe. Uh, Krishna happily came back. And Narada had described to Yavana how Krishna looks like. He is dark blue in color, wears a yellow silk always. And uh, all the ornaments, every description was there. When Yavana saw Oh, he recognized, oh, this is Krishna. And he tried to uh, attack him. But Krishna came without any weapon. And what did he, Krishna do? Seeing Yavana coming to attack him, he ran. Hey, fool, don't run away. Face the enemy. No, he didn't wait. wait. He ran. Yavana gave chase. They ran and ran, and then suddenly Krishna entered a cave. Yavana followed. Looked around. There's nothing, nobody. Then he uh, got adjusted to the darkness of the cave and found somebody sleeping there. Oh, coming to the cave, you pretend to be sleeping. And he went and kicked. The person who was sleeping was woken up. And he, who, who, who woke me up? He looked at Yavana and Yavana was burned to ashes. That was a sage or a king by name Mujukunda, 
the story is this king was very powerful and the gods asked his help to protect them against the demons so he fought with them for for the gods for many for a long time and then when gods got kartikeya of subramanya as their commander he said now the god said now you can go back thank you very much for your service all these years now you can go back to your kingdom but your kingdom won't be there your family because human years and god's years are big difference all your family is all gone so what can you do what can we do for you can we give any any boon that you ask please will give you he said i have been working so long now i want to sleep i want a good rest i want to sleep undisturbed i want to sleep if anybody disturbs me wake me up no the god said all right you can have a good rest if anybody disturbs your sleep just by looking that person will be killed and that's what krishna made use of that um boon given to muchukunda to get kalevana killed in one stroke without any bloodshed he destroyed the enemy isn't that efficiency in action <clears throat> then we can see krishna saying for things which are which you cannot avoid there's no it's meaningless to grieve tasmat aparihari arthe natvam shojitam arhasi therefore you should not grieve over unavoidable here krishna is taking a common sense stance there are many things which you cannot avoid in life which since it cannot avoid why do you grieve over it bear with them now for example it's very hot we go on complaining it is hot it is hot it is hot is it going to change bear with them do whatever you can to reduce your discomfort but grieving over it complaining over it it's not going to change unavoidable things you have to bear with <clears throat> pain disease accidents disappointments poverty old age death these things you cannot avoid so bear with them in the same way there are the other side happiness success good health um wealth beauty all this come but we never complain about those things we are happy when when we enjoy those things we forget that they will end one day just as the misery also will end one day happiness the good things also will come to an end one day and because we are not thinking that way when it happens it's a shock we are not prepared for it <clears throat> so how can we pre prepare ourselves not to grieve over the unavoidable things there are many six accident uh, disease or death unavoidable in in the second chapter shri krishna says there is one thing definite in the universe if you are born you will die and if you are dead you will be born again that happens till you get freedom final freedom or liberation you will be born again that's a definite if you are born you will die whatever you do you can you may prolong your life for a long time using the medical the latest medical medical advances but still you will die one day that's sure you cannot uh, avoid death it's unavoidable so how are we to prepare ourselves not to grieve over these unavoidables by outgrowing our childish notion of life the idea that the world should give everything that i demand everybody should 
uh, follow my advice or whatever I, sh I say should be accepted. These are all little children do that. If adults do that, it's child we say it's childish behavior. We have to outgrow that. <clears throat> you have to learn to face realities. Also, by trying to keep the mind calm and steady, by recognizing that misery, old age, death, these are unavoidable, this will happen. You tell yourself, prepare, this will happen. So I'm not going to get upset. This is the sure thing to happen one day or other. We don't know when, that's all. <clears throat> In short, we have to grow up. We cannot, when, it, when little children, it's fine. But we have to grow up. We cannot remain children all, all through. So there's a, I found a quote from the psychologist Reginald Weil. He says, he or she, I don't know. No one of, no one of us can live worthily and fruitfully until he is prepared to be a grown-up person, willing to look at facts rather than at wishes. You must be ready to look at facts rather than wishes. Oh, I wish I were like this. I wish I had this. No, facts, look at facts. Real childhood has its own lovely and natural qualities. Real childhood. But there is nothing likable or admirable in a grown-up baby. So we had to grow up. We cannot say that, oh, I want this. And throwing, a, and throwing a tantrum? No. He said, grow up. Face the reality. Then another thing Sri Krishna says is, Samoham sarva bhudeshu name desho sti na priyaha. I am same towards all beings. None is hateful and none dear to me. See, I am same towards all. There is nobody who is whom I hate or who is dear to me. But those who worship me with devotion dwell in me and I too dwell in them. So uh, does that mean God is partial? God is like the worldly people who favor those who flatter them and avoid those who don't flatter them? Then what's the difference between God and ordinary people? No. It's not like that. He says, those who worship me with devotion dwell in me. And I too dwell in them. What does that mean? Those who go towards God are nearer to God. It's not the fault of God. See, just uh, to give a, a crude example of that. Say, it's, it's, it, we are, now we are already in spring, but in winter, it's very cold. So we have the heater on and sit near the heater, we get the warmth. Sit far away from the heater, heater is in that corner, I'm sitting in that corner, and I say, the heater is very partial, it's not giving me the warmth. Is it the fault of the heater? Because I'm far away. Same way. We are far away from God. It's not, the part, it's, God, it's not that God is partial. The fault is with us. You can see an, a nice example of that <clears throat> Krishna being not uh, samoham, equal to all. Just before the Purikshatra battle started, not just before, a few days before, Duryodhana was advised to go and seek the help of Krishna. So he went to to Krishna, um, the, of course, being Duryodhana, the guards allowed him to go to Sri Krishna's bedroom. Sri Krishna was sleeping. So he's, there was a chair near his bed. He sat on the chair. After a short time, Arjuna also came. Arjuna came, found Krishna sleeping, Duryodhana sitting near his bed, so there's no other place to sit. Anyway, he stood there at the foot of the bed. He stood there with folded hands and waited for Krishna to wake up. 
After some time, Krishna woke up, opened his eyes. Oh, Arjuna, you're here. What's the matter? Then Duryodhana said, I came first. Oh, you are here. You, you, you're lying, there, lying down on the bed. When you get up, first you see the person who is in the in front. You don't look side. Oh, what's the, oh, both of you are here. What's the matter? Oh, we have come. Both said, I come to ask your help for the come upcoming battle. Hmm. Krishna said, all right. Both two, are, I, I cannot divide myself into two, but I can do one thing. One person can have my whole army. They are as powerful as me, myself. And the other, pers other person can have myself. But I won't take up any arms. Now we have got to choose. And Arjuna being the younger one, and he is the first whom I saw, Arjuna got the choice. So, giving the choice to both is not Depriving one of, or other, no. And Arjuna chose Sri Krishna. Duryodhana was really happy because he got the army. And Krishna, he won't a, take any weapon, he said. So what's the point of having Krishna? I've got army with full, um, all the weapons. Like, that is good. Duryodhana was happy. But here who is um, close, close, getting close to Krishna Arjuna afterwards Krishna asked why did you choose me he asked Arjuna why did you choose me then he, Arjuna says I didn't come for the army I came for you I want you I want you to be my charioteer so if I if I give my chariot to your hands you will be directing the whole course of the battle. So you, if we give our hand over the reins of our life to, the, to God, God will take it over and he will direct it in the right way. You don't have to worry anymore. <clears throat> so we cannot say Krishna, God is partial. It is up to us whether we want to go towards God or not. That's why Krishna says, I am same to all. There is none hateful or none dear. It's up to you. If you come close to me, you are dear because you get the warmth. If you stay away, you you lose it. Not that you I hate you, but you lose it. It's your fault. <clears throat> so God's grace is always there. We have to become grace worthy. Not that God grace gives grace to some particular people. There, in spirituality, there is no privilege. There is no special privilege for some people. No. If you think that somebody is getting greater blessing, they are made themselves grace worthy. God's grace is always there. We, we have to make ourselves grace worthy. <clears throat> As Sri Ramakrishna says, the the breeze of God's grace is always blowing. Those sailors who unfurl their mass, they catch the wind. Others don't. I'll just uh, conclude with a few words of Swami Vivekananda. <clears throat> Swamiji says about Sri Krishna. He was the most wonderful sannyasin and the most wonderful householder in one. Why do we call uh, Swamiji calls Krishna sannyasin? Because he was party sannyasa. In the Gita, Sri Krishna says sannyasa is unattached to the results of action. Complete detachment. Complete detachment is real sannyasa. It's not the cloth. No, not the, not the ochre cloth. Complete detachment. So he was the most wonderful sannyasin and the most wonderful householder in one. He had the most wonderful amount of rajas power. He did so much. Why did Krishna have to do so much act action? Not a moment he stayed without working. 
He says, there is nothing for me to gain by performing action, but I do continuously because for the welfare of the world, I do because seeing me, people take me as the example. And if I don't do, then they think, oh, Krishna didn't do, so I should we do. As the role model, he performed action for it, to show us how to perform action. <clears throat> he had the most wonderful amount of rajas, power, and was at the same time living in the midst of the most wonderful renunciation. Krishna, the preacher of Gita, was all his life the embodiment of the song celestial. He was the great illustration of non-attachment. A great landmark in the history of religion, his contribution, the ideal of love for love's sake, work for work's sake, duty for duty's sake. And it for the first time fell from the lips of the greatest incarnation, Krishna, and for the first time in the history of humanity on the soil of India. Thank you. So we have a, a lot of events coming up this month, special events. We've got the yoga class every Thursday morning from 10 to 11.15 a.m. You're always welcome to attend. Next Friday night, we have the Bhagavad Gita discussion that will be led by Guy Chapanaji. Next Sunday, we have the monthly talk on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And what we'll be doing from now on, there will be uh, a, a short introductory talk by Prabhuji Chapanaji. And that'll be followed by Archie Panaji's talk. And then there'll be a, a guided meditation. I'll, I'll, I will conduct a guided meditation. On Sunday the 15th, we've got the meditation day, as we've been announcing. That's from 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's almost full. So anybody else wishing to attend, you better let us know as soon as you can. Following Sunday the 22nd, we've got a retreat at Dharama, at our retreat center in Robertson in the Southern Highlands. If you'd like to attend, you've got the option to join either from, from Saturday evening, at least by about 6 p.m. And it will go through to Sunday afternoon, to 4 p.m. So you have the option to stay overnight or come for the day on Sunday. If you're coming from the Saturday evening, uh, we, we, it's possible we might be able to give you a lift down We've got some room in our car to take a few people. And so we'll please let us know if you're interested in that. We're, we're still planning for that. And yeah, yeah, we'll give more information anyway in our weekly email. Uh, there'll be, be more details about the program. So now please stay back and get a share of sweet and savouries. And thanks for joining us in person today. And thanks to those who have joined on Zoom.